Hello, everyone, and welcome to this video version of the ACB Advocacy Update. We are coming to you on our ACB YouTube channel, Facebook, within the ACB community, and of course, audio, on the ACB Media Network. I am one of your hosts, Clark Rockfall, the Director of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs for the American Council of the Blind, and I am joined by my colleague. And I am Swatha Nanda Kumar, ACB's Advocacy and Outreach Specialist. So Swatha, I don't know about you, but for me, growing up as an, an older millennial, shall we say, uh, in the 80s and 90s, just down the road here in Annapolis, Maryland, we would take field trips all the time into Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian. And my absolute favorite growing up was the Air and Space Museum. Uh, to have everything from uh, the spirit of St. Louis, uh, you know, Charles Lindbergh's plane, to Saturn V rockets and videos of uh, different different space probes flying over Mars and other planets that just blew my mind. And of course, this was the golden age of the space shuttles and the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so space and what, is, what else is out there? Now, granted, like in the 80s, we had ET as well, right? The friendly extraterrestrial. So it was all about space. Uh, I don't know if you've had the, the same passion for what lies beyond Swatha in, in your life? I do, Clark. Um, I did not grow up in the 90s or 80s like you did, but um, I definitely remember the 70s? going to Chicago. Right, what? You grew up in the 70s, the 60s? The, the 2000s. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm that young. Right. Um, yeah, so I remember going to Chicago and going to the Space Museum and um, learning about all the astro astronomers and and just being fascinated with all of all that, um, the, the all that up um, technology and just with kind of realizing how small our world, how small we really are in the, in the world in the universe. So it's like you have fascinated so. Yeah, and as much as I found it fascinating, I know I knew that for me, as my vision was slowly getting worse, that you know, being being a part of the space program really wasn't an option, and that I wasn't getting the full experience as the rest of my classmates. Um, but there's been some really exciting innovations in this space. You know, a, a lot of the Smithsonian's are doing more interactive and accessible exhibits. Our friends at the uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, at the Rocket Center there do a space camp for students who are blind and low vision. You know, where where was that when I was growing up? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and now many of our members in the, the blindness community as a whole have been getting very excited uh, this summer because as uh, a new addition to our you know solar system and universe exploration has been unveiled the james webb space telescope these images are coming to us with some amazing descriptions and alt text that really brings the images to life, not only for people who are blind, uh, but the, the rest of the population as well. Even sighted people can now understand what exactly am I looking at here? And Swatha, that's really what, what we're doing here today. We've got some great guests who are here to talk with us about what exactly they're doing it and how they're doing it. Yep, so from the Space Telescope Science Institute, we have Tim Rue, who is an informal education specialist. Um, we also have Claire Blom, who is a principal science writer. And we have Kelly Lebo, 
who is the education outreach specialist from the Space Telescope Institute. Um, hi, 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 how are you guys? Hi, Swatha. Uh, thank you very much. It's 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 great to be here. Uh, this is Tim Roo speaking, um, and uh, I'll let uh, Claire and Kelly say hi as well. Hi, it's an honor to be here. This is Claire. I'm so happy to join. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Kelly. And yes, I am really excited to be here and talk about space with you all. I'm also an elder millennial, and the 90s were a very formative time. <laughs> <laughs> Right on, Kelly. And I know that uh, you were very active on social media, engaging with people as their their minds were literally being blown um, with the the initial batch of images from the James Webb Space Telescope, responding, answering questions. Um, so we're we're so excited to have all three of you here today. But special shout out to Kelly for engaging on social media as well. Oh, thank you. I was just excited that everyone was excited. A mutual excitement uh, party. <laughs> That's what we've got going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so Tim, we'd like to begin with you. If, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about um, just really what is your role in this program, as well as how did you how did you get involved in this program? Oh, sure. So my background my background is in museums um i spent a bit of time at the smithsonian uh myself uh both both as a visitor and as uh, someone who worked there working with the public uh teaching everybody who came in and it's i've always loved sharing uh this wonder of space and 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 science and everything with the public and getting people excited and thinking in new ways um and i came and joined uh space telescope few years back uh, and I've been part of the whole team effort here working with museums, libraries, other informal learning sites around the country, helping them figure out how can I do a better job sharing space with, with my particular audience. And I'll say that bringing, bringing space to new people, getting new people involved in this, this conversation is, is I, I, I just love it. It's so wonderful to be involved in. And I've been pushing to find out how how can we do things better? How can we reach the folks who we haven't been reaching? And since the images have been such a central portion of what we have done at Space Telescope, I mean, we, we, we're we're not just the science operations for the Hubble Space Telescope and the mission and science operations for Webb and archives for 20 other NASA missions and getting involved in other upcoming missions. I mean, Kelly, Claire, and I are all in the Office of Public Outreach. So those images that come out from the Hubble, those images that have been coming out for web, from the web, we have people in this office that are creating those. Um, but there are so many people out there that just haven't had a chance to, uh, haven't had a chance to, um, be part of those images the way that someone who's sighted is. So um, we've been trying to figure out new ways to make those accessible to people. And, and some of this alt text that we're going to talk about today is just part of that. Thanks, Tim. And, and Claire, how about you? Uh, what is your role and how did you get involved with this program? Sure. I've been at Space Telescope for about five years. Um, I'm a writer, so I write anything and everything. Um, not only uh, Hubble discoveries in press releases that are sent out, um, but also some of the press releases that went out about Webb's first full color images and data this summer. Um, in addition to that, I also write scripts for videos that we put out that really help bring to life, add some motion um, and additional graphics. Those also have uh, audio descriptions, I'm proud to say. Um, so they're accessible as well. It's a view space. Um, and then Clark I of shakes course, his fist in the air, celebrating in the background. Exactly. <laughs> and then I also um, have done a really big push with our social media. Um, and lately, our social media coordinator has really um, helped us increase the accessibility there. So in addition to writing really engaging posts that explore what's happening in the images, we're providing alt texts that are in your feeds on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So everything's right at your fingertips. You don't need to go anywhere else to find the complete picture. That is awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Kelly, please share with us more about your role in this program and how you got involved. 
Sure. Um, so I am an astronomer. I have a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. And while I was in grad school, I realized that while doing science is fun, I like talking about science a lot more. So I've done a whole lot of different jobs uh, before coming to STSCI about two years ago. Um, and so I'm an outreach scientist. And what I do is a lot of reviewing all of the stuff we put out to make sure that it's scientifically accurate. Um, and that includes reviewing the alt text uh, for both some of the first images and also all of the social media that we put out. All right. And when you say uh, that you joined STSI, that is the Space, Space Telescope, Telescope Science Institute? That is correct. Thank you for catching me on that jargon. <laughs> No worries. It's, uh, it's easy to do uh, when we are so, so immersed. Exactly. Um, so why don't we just jump in here? And for, for folks who, who do not know or they've, they've read the name James Webb, but they're not exactly sure what it is uh, or what's going on, please, uh, can someone provide more just general background information on what exactly is the James Webb Space Telescope and why is it so significant? Sure, so the James Webb Space Telescope is NASA's newest flagship mission. It's staring out at the stars uh, and gathering all sorts of new information. Um, one of the biggest things about it is that James Webb Space Telescope can see in infrared light. It collects light that we, that nobody is able to see with their own eyes. Um, if you think about the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, well, there are there's light beyond that. And Webb is seeing some of that light that's got longer wavelengths uh, called infrared. And that is really helping us learn more about the way the universe works. And it's getting the getting images that are the same sort of resolution that the Hubble Space Telescope has been collecting for the past 30 years. Um, and there's all sorts of amazing things that we're able to learn as a result of that. All right, and as you mentioned, Hubble's been around for 30 years. So um, other than, I guess, being able to see at the, the infrared spectrum, are there other differences between Hubble and James Webb? Kelly, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so Hubble has a smaller mirror than Webb. It turns out that the larger, the longer the wavelength you want to observe, the redder the light you want to observe, the bigger the mirror you need. So Webb is actually, uh, it has a 6.6 .6 meter mirror as opposed to about a, a two meter mirror for uh, Hubble. It's also very far away. So Hubble is orbiting the Earth while uh, Webb is about a million miles away at a special point called L2. Uh, and that allows the telescope to be very, very, very cold. Uh, because one thing about infrared light is that you and me and the computer that I'm talking into are all glowing very brightly in infrared light. And none of us can see this, but if you have a special detector like what is on Webb, it's glowing in infrared light. And so Webb wants to see something other than itself. So it has to be ridiculously cold, a couple degrees above absolute zero. And that is very tricky to do, but Webb is doing it right now. That is so oh. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not, not, no pun intended, no pun intended, no pun intended, no pun intended, but yeah. <laughs> it is both definitions of cool. Yeah, and I'm sure this will happen a lot during this conversation, but my mind is already significantly blown, so thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so so James Webb is capturing these images and all of this data. Um, I guess, what's the process from capturing these images and data and them becoming what folks are reading about and viewing um, when they're released to the public. So there's there's a lot that goes into that. Um, we have to get that data down from the telescope. Uh, there's a lot of processing that happens here internally in the Institute that honestly, I don't know all the details of. It's, 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 it's a little beyond me. 
Um, and then we've got some folks who have to actually take that and translate it into some sort of method that, that we can sense. Um, and, I, you know, actually, Claire was there involved in the room when these first images came down and were being made and there were all sorts of iterations. And I think she can, she can tell that story. Uh, there's some really cool things that I think you should hear from her. So Claire? Absolutely. So uh, the data come down, so it's a, it's a little um, surprising to see initially once it's on someone's computer. Um, I was in the room when um, the lead astronomer was was downloading data. He he ushered, he waved his hand and he said, come over, come over, look at this. Webb's data are coming down. Um, and he had his screen open and I honestly did not know what to expect. And it was a series of binary codes. So zeros and one just, ones just filled his screen. Um, and that is the data that then becomes transferred to a uh, software program called DS9. Um, and there, uh, rudimentary colors can be applied. You can change the contrast. So you could add, for example, those first images that we were seeing once he plugged it into that program to just quickly look to see what the data actually looked like. Were they clean? Were they messy? What was going on? And they were incredibly high definition, incredibly clean, very crisp. And so it was this black and orange image um, showing different star formation region, a uh, star formation region all across the screen. And we had this huge TV screen in the room. So it was blown up and everybody just gasped. <laughs> we almost couldn't believe what we were looking at. And then as Tim alluded, there is a lot of processing that happens. So not only do the astronomers need to look at the actual data to make sure there aren't artifacts like cosmic rays or bright spots that should be subtracted so that you can actually study the regions of gas and stars that are surrounding it. Um, once that happens and that's cleaned up, that's an automated process, then it goes into our archive. But then that's where our image processors retrieve the data. And then they go in and they do lots of different treatments to it. Um, you know, being that, like Kelly mentioned earlier and Tim, we can't see infrared with our own eyes. They have to apply color to those images. Um, and they have to be very selective. It's not only about the contrast, um, but it's about you know, which colors align to which types of elements that are detected. Web has special filters that detect particular elements. So you can isolate for those if that's what your, er your area of research is to study it more um, distinctly and in much more detail. Uh, but they combine many filters, put it all in one image and end up making it a very balanced composition. It is not art. <laughs> it is definitely a craft, though. They're very carefully and accurately handling the data before releasing a final full color image uh, through our newsroom. So, Claire, that more on the the colors. You mentioned it's a, you know, more of a, a science than an art, and that they have to be very selective of the colors used. How how do you know? what colors to use how do you know something is a blue and not a red in an image so the various filters and kelly might be able to speak to this a bit more accurately offhand than i but the the various filters capture different elements of the electromagnetic spectrum particularly infrared light so infrared light is, is a very vast so if you were imagining a chart that went from left to right imagine left might be the shorter wavelengths of infrared light and the right might be longer wavelengths of infrared light so different filters absorb different areas, small segments of that wider spectrum. So then when there are, for example, six filters that are selected to be added to an image, um, our colleagues will assign particular colors along the you know, chromatic ordering. So blue indicates a shorter wavelength of infrared light, and then it goes all the way across to red. Um, and so that's how they combine the colors. Um, but then of course, through the, the application and then those multiple exposures being added into one image, you get that nice combination of color. So then they're adjusting for contrast to ensure that you know, a region isn't overly obscured um, for any particular reason, um, whether it's by a really bright nearby star, which they might crop out or subtract, um, depending on what the focus of the, the science or the, the image is. 
Kelly, is there anything I missed in that? No, yeah, I think that was, you know, very clear. Uh, yeah, and just sort of a big picture understanding is that you take your image with a series of filters, you assign the the shortest wavelength blue, the longest wavelength red, somewhere in the middle green, stack them all together, and that is your final color image, plus a little bit of tweaking, as Claire mentioned. So you're using the same color spectrum that Tim mentioned earlier of visible light of you know, the, the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You spread that across the infrared spectrum when exactly. doing this? Yes, we're mapping uh, infrared light onto visible colors um, so that uh, the photon receptors in our eyes uh, can, can process that information. Okay, and we will have more, uh, more questions related to this topic later on because one, one cool thing about this event is we have some questions from our members. Uh, we're not there yet, but our members are folks who might be totally blind. They they might be visually impaired or have low vision, and their vision may be deteriorating over time, or they could have been blind their entire lives. So some people will want to know, uh, so, I guess some of our members have experienced colors, others not so much, um, and have really fascinating questions and want to learn more about uh, what the universe and our galaxy looks like, as well as how how this operates. So we'll get to those questions here in a bit. But all right, so Swatha, now we've got we've got our data. We have our color images. They're going to the the press and media team. Uh, we want to know about something else, isn't that right? Yeah, the the all text descriptions or how our members really want to know how you wrote them and. Um how they came about. So kind of, I just want to know if like um, in origins, like it's like origin story, like how did, how did this program, this project come about? And how did like you, is that involved in that? Okay, that yeah. Touch on a bit, yeah. Yeah, so we've been, we've been working on uh, improving the accessibility of our websites and our materials for, for a few years. Um, it really started with some, some internal work, some self-education. Um, some folks may be uh, aware of the web content accessibility guidelines, which are which are some guidelines out there that help tell folks how to make an accessible website. Um, so we started learning a little bit more about those, teaching ourselves, and started addressing some of the things that we could easily understand, like color contrast, and ensuring that we had alt text in the first place. Um, but then as, as we learned more and we worked with more folks, we, we realized, you know, we really need to bring in some outside folks who know about this, who've lived with this experience. Um, we actually pulled in a uh, outside consulting group um, made up of some folks who have disabilities of various sorts. Uh, many of them are blind and visually impaired themselves, and they focus on, on helping folks with their websites. Um, and they've Work, we've worked with them on a number of different issues. We continue to. Um, one of the things that they got to do with us was create some, they, we did some exercises. The, the, the writers uh, had a chance to try making some alt text and having getting some immediate feedback from them and then revising and going back and forth. There were a few things that we learned. Uh, like, for example, short alt text used to be the recommendation, but uh, we, we were told it's kind of fallen out of favor with a lot of folks who used it, at least depending on the context, if you're not looking at a, at a big table with 50 images and just trying to figure out what they are. Um, getting into more in depth, figuring out what is actually in this image, what's what's all involved in there is, is, is really great. We learned a little bit about how it's used, about how alt text is often really flat. Like, as soon as it starts to play, it, it'll play the whole thing. You could restart it, but you can't jump to different points within it, uh, as opposed to structured text that might have headings or might use lists or uh, have tables in there. So we actually have done a little bit more than just the alt text. We actually have uh, what we call some extended descriptions as well. If you go to any of the, the pages on the uh, webtelescope.org website where the images are, there are download options for text descriptions. And in there, we've got extended descriptions, which actually go beyond uh, the character limit that we have internally on our on our alt text and 
uh, take as much space as we need to to explore that image and can use some of these different structural elements to, to look at it a little bit more. Uh, those are currently downloadable. Um, we're in intending to move that to HTML to make those even more accessible as we go forward. Um, we've been developing some internal guidelines on how to write this text. Claire can talk more about that because she's been writing the style guide for us. Um, and I'll also note that all of this work, a lot of this, it had to be done before we even started getting data from the telescope because we didn't have much time. We got that, we had those, that data, we started putting together images, we started iterating, and there was very little time to put the alt text together. So it's been a lot of work. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Claire and say, uh, what, what would you like to add about how we've gone about creating all this alt text? It's just been so extremely educational for me. Um, but in addition, as a writer, it's improved my craft. I am far more likely to direct people. It doesn't have to be um, extremely literal, though sometimes I'll say something very direct, like around 4 o'clock, right? We might have an idea if you're thinking of a clock that has hands um, and numbers, you know, approximately where that might be. So then mentally you can start to go, oh, okay, that's the area of the image we're talking about. Um, so just going through this exercise of writing and writing and writing some more, um, it was a lot easier for the um, articles that I had written. I knew why we just selected the images to pair with the articles and what they were communicating, but it was much more difficult when I hadn't written the article itself. Um, so I had to do that process of discovery. What is this? Just like anybody else who might visit the website. Um, and I wanted to be sure that it was clear and complete and honestly, something that you could skim or really speed up as you're listening to it. Um, you know, not overly repeating topics, but also not under repeating. And then learning that the inclusion of color is important um, was really, really meaningful to me um, because A, I wanted to cite it anyway. I can see it. I want to share what I can see. Um, but also just realizing that then somebody who has just listened to so much alt text and heard the repetition of blue or sky blue again and again, they're going to start to collect those memories and kind of compile them mentally and refer one back to the other. And so then they'll start to form those relationships. So it's every time I'm writing, I'm learning something new, not only about how to write alt text, but about the image itself and then how to improve my own writing and the captions and the press releases. Can you speak? I think Tim mentioned bringing out the groups to help you with the whole text um, and writing it. Um, can you speak to what that looked like and what, who did you consult with? So I can say we we worked with that outside group that I mentioned earlier before we ended up getting the data. Once we got the data, it was very restricted as to who was able to have access it, able to access it. Um, this was a really big thing for NASA. So there were not that many people who were able, were able to see these uh, images or read the alt text before it actually got released uh, back on uh, the 12th of July. And, but that said, we, it was a really a team process in putting together this alt text. Um, we had writers like Claire who were drafting it. Uh, we had uh, scientists like Kelly who were reviewing this and checking over that scientific accuracy. We had some people a little more familiar with some of the accessibility guidelines like myself going through and reviewing it. And we also had, uh, we have someone on our team, one of our developers who is visually impaired himself, who was going through, he uses a screen reader sometimes. He's also able, when he takes a little bit more time, able to uh, see the images. And he was going through and uh, giving us some feedback on what was working, what wasn't working. So really, I think that team process, bringing everybody together, is one of the really big factors in and that contributed to the what actually came out the the alt text that you finally are able to hear. Okay. And I guess just to, to ask the question a different way, uh, do you think there are are there things that you learned from going through this process, even before having the images, with uh, folks with disabilities, with working with folks who are blind and, and low vision um, to develop this process. Are there things that you learned in that process that 
you may not have learned or incorporated otherwise? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that that people who rely on alt text every day have a different way of experiencing the world, uh, a different way of taking in information. And there were definitely stylistic changes in what we were mentioning. There were there there were things that we changed about how we wrote it. Um, Claire was talking a bit about color. Back before we started working with the folks, we were trying to trim trim out mentions of color and make things as brief as possible. And, and that was a mistake in a lot of ways. Um, and Claire, would you like to add on to that? Sure. Um, there were just, basically when I think about writing alt text, what I like to do is set the broad scene. It's like I'm painting a picture all across, you know, left to right, top to bottom. Um, what literally does this scene contain? So I want to I want to paint broad strokes, right? I'm orienting people. And then once I've oriented someone with a brief sentence, two sentences, then I can start to go into what are the areas of interest? Why are we releasing this image? What is the scientific discovery? So then I might draw attention um, to let's say the star that's cast off its layers of gas and dust, but pointing out that the star is this tiny white you know blob at the center, um, and then all the layers that you know in one case it looks like a butterfly, and knowing that we can say it looks like a butterfly, not necessarily because people have seen it, but they might have touched it or experienced the shape, so then they can start to build a mental model of what this scene looks like. Um, and then really ensuring that I'm also using proper terms. For example, a star that's cast off all of its layers of gas and dust is properly called a white dwarf or a white dwarf star. So including that in the alt text is incredibly important. And this is another thing I learned so that when um, someone is listening to the caption that's on the rest of the page, all of those th pieces of information are starting to connect. So not only have you, I helped you build a visual scene, then you're learning about why we're showing you this visual scene and what type of research was done um, to obtain that. And it's not necessarily imagery because a lot of our um, discoveries are based on spectra, uh, which are data that spread the light out and then you can measure the individual molecules within it. So there, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes of the scientific process. It's not only about these beautiful images. Um, so being able to describe that process in the captions is important. And that's another reason why I really appreciated Kelly's feedback, um, because at times she would say, yes, of course, you can cite these proper terms, but you can't explain why we know that that's what it is. That part does not belong in the alt text. That belongs in the caption where everybody can access it and where it's most relevant. Yeah, I think that, that is something that I've been uh, fighting for, right? So an alt, alt text should just describe the image and not try to explain the science. And it's real tempting to want to explain the science. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, to follow up on that, uh, how do you, it, how did you find the balance? Like, how did you get that balance between like someone you might know, not know or nebula is versus like somebody might just want to know how you, how you know it's nebula? Like, how do you get that yeah. Balance? So that's a really good question, right? So how do I write alt text or how do I contribute to alt text for someone who's never seen a nebula before? Um, so I like to approach alt text thinking of someone who is uh, who has seen a lot of astronomical images before and is trying to describe those to someone else. Um, so you can use terms like star or nebula or galaxy in the same way that you can use dog or house, right? So there are lots of different ways that dogs look, right? There are big dogs and small dogs and dogs with curly fur and straight fur. But you can say this is an image of a dog, right? And you could use the same sort of big conceptual things to say this is an image of a nebula, this is an image of a galaxy. Um, and if there's particular features of that nebula or galaxy, then you can describe them. 
So I'm trying to act as a guide uh, for you, but also I don't want to assume, I don't have to want to describe everything from scratch because that's going to be too much. So I can say this is an image of a nebula rather than trying to describe exactly how blobby it is or whatever. Um, just like that, I can That's a use technical a, term, right? Yeah. <laughs> Astronomers use the word blob and blobby a lot. It is in fact a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a lot of discussions about astronomers and naming things internally. Yeah, and that we're very bad at. <laughs> I didn't want to say it as I'm not an astronomer myself. <laughs> I'd just like to tack on to something Kelly was saying. Um, I do sneak in very brief definitions into the alt text, so I'm connecting things. So I'll say, this is an image of a nebula, comma, a star that's cast off its layers of gas and dust, which are seen here in, and then I describe the colors and the shapes of what it's cast off. So I do try to provide those baseline definitions because you're right, these are technical terms and no one should be expected to have this um, baseline knowledge. And we're writing for literally everyone. So it needs to be accessible no matter um, how much or how little you've read about astronomy. So do we have any, uh, any images that we could uh, share here as an example and read through the alt text? Absolutely. Uh, what should we start with here? The southern ring, Claire? Sure. All right. Would you like to uh, yes. do the reading? So this uh, page is titled The southern ring, southern ring Nebula, the Miri Image. And just to be clear, Miri is a, an instrument on the Webb Space Telescope, and it observes mid-infrared light, which is a bit farther and longer than near-infrared light. So the alt text reads this way. The Southern Ring Nebula is a large, semi-transparent oval that is slightly angled from top left to bottom right. Two stars appear at the center very close to one another. The one at left is red, the one at right is light blue. The blue star has tiny diffraction spikes around it. A large translucent red oval surrounds the stars. From the red oval, shells extend in a mix of colors. The shells that extend to the left and right are red, and the shells that extend to the top and bottom are teal. The shells appear to have a filamentary pattern similar to the surface of a citrus fruit that's been cut. The shells darken in color with distance from the center. The background is black and speckled with tiny bright stars in distant galaxies in a range of colors. Wow. Wow, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Kelly, in, in that description, going back to the conversation about um, you know, science and, and technical jargon while still explaining the image, um, mm -hmm. Are there, were there aspects of that description that had to be you know, negotiated or discussed and worked through? Um, so I was not involved in reviewing that particular image, but um, yes, I mean, there is some back and forth to make sure that this description is scientifically accurate. Um, to describe the center points as stars. Um, to describe the background as having many different stars and galaxies. You could describe those a different way. You could just call them points of light. But it's important, especially uh, as an astronomer looking at the image, those are the type of things that I see with my expert eyes and something I also want to convey to our audience. I don't know, Claire, if you have any other anecdotes working with astron other astronomers on this one. Um no, it's it's I've uh, I think I've learned enough through writing probably now a few hundred of these descriptions um, to know when I'm when I'm bordering into uh, over overly defining, uh, for example, a term like gravitational lensing, right? Like I might avoid that term in the alt text, um, but I'm still describing the process. I'm still actually defining it. It just depends. Um, on how important that is to the caption, to the story, to the press release. 
All right. And uh, Kelly, what the heck are diffraction spikes? <laughs> because that okay. comes up a lot in many of these, the alt text for these images. Are, the, are diffraction spikes, uh, you know, originally occurring in nature or is that something specific to these images? Okay, diffraction spikes. So uh, stars appear as just points of light, but when you put a point of light through a telescope, especially a telescope made with mirrors like Webb is, the optics of the telescope uh, will impart a spiky shape on this. And so the stars look star-shaped, I guess. Uh, and so Webb in particular makes stars with eight points, Six of those points comes from Webb's mirror. So Webb has a hexagon shaped mirror. And so each corner of that hexagon makes a point on stars. And then uh, Webb is also designed so it has a little mirror in front of a big mirror. And there are supports that hold up that little mirror. And those supports also impart a pattern onto the star shapes. And those are is a smaller uh, also six pointed star and that overlaps a little bit. And if you add it all together, it makes eight pointed stars, um, which I think are really beautiful. Uh, different telescopes make different diffraction spike shapes. For example, the Hubble Space Telescope has four pointed stars. And actually, I'm, I'm really happy that you asked that question, because this is a question that we get all of the time from people who are just looking at the images uh, visually, they're like, why are all the stars shaped like that? So the fact that it comes through in the alt text as well is it, really good. <laughs> I'd also like to add just one more fun bit about this. It's a nice piece of party trivia, if you will. How can you tell the difference between a Hubble image and a Webb image? Hubble has four diffraction spikes on its stars, while Webb has eight. I will remember that for the next time I go to pub trivia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Swatha, do you have any questions or should we uh, try to share another image in alt text before getting to our member questions? I would like to see the next image, so let's go ahead and share it. All right. How about, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, here's an image of Neptune. This wasn't one of the first images released, but this is an image Webb has taken since. And I know, Kelly, you were involved in this one a little bit. I was. Do you want me to read this one? Sure, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Image titled Neptune, near cam. Image has a mostly dark background with one extremely bright point of light that dominates the upper left quadrant of the image and a glowing sphere towards the bottom middle of the image. The extremely bright point of light at the upper left of the image has eight spikes pointing out from a center bright point like a compass. The glowing sphere is mostly white, almost neon, with a few extremely bright patches representing methane ice clouds. The glowing sphere is accompanied by several narrow faint rings and six tiny white dots, which are Neptune's moons. Splattered throughout the mostly black background is about 10 small, dim, blurry circles which represent distant galaxies. And so um, one thing that came out of my review of this really gorgeous picture of Neptune and its really gorgeous alt text is that there's that bright star-like thing that we just described. And that is actually the moon Triton. So Triton, is a very extremely icy moon and it's really, really shiny. It reflects something like 80% of the light that hits it. And so it looks like a star in this image, but is in fact a very sneaky moon. And uh, it was called a star in the original alt text and I, I flagged that and it got taken out for the one that was eventually published. One of the things that I kind of love about this image and and love about the, the fact that it's a web image uh, kind of goes back to one of those those questions you were asking earlier, Clark, about like how is what web 
telling us different from what we learned with something like Hubble. And in this image, Triton's actually brighter than Neptune. The, new, the moon is brighter than the planet. And that is true in infrared. But if you were looking at this invisible light, Neptune would be much brighter than its moon. So it's one of those different, different things that we can learn from looking at the, the universe in different ways. Yes, every time you look at the universe with different types of light, you learn something new. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, this brings up a question that uh, we've heard a lot from our members, especially those who have never seen the planets before. And thank you for sharing this description of Neptune. Um, are there descriptions from the James Webb Space Telescope of other planets in our solar system as well? I don't believe we have put out images from Space Telescope Science Institute. Therefore, we haven't written the alt text for them yet. Uh, they're I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit because I know there was some data from Mars that we did recently. Claire, do you know about that one? I do. It was uh, issued as a blog post because it is still too early to publish science. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, it takes a little bit of time to write the paper, but then the paper has to be peer reviewed by, by many people um, and then formally accepted and then, of course, published. So it takes a little bit of time. So we've been trying to preview some science through our web blog um, and there were some uh, images released. So there might be one of Mars that we can pinpoint for you later. Um, I don't have it offhand, but Webb also uh, will observe many of the planets, though not all, and Kelly can probably specify exactly which and which will not be observed. So we will get to see and hear about uh, all most of the planets in our solar system uh, with Webb. Kelly? Yes. Uh, well, the problem is we can't point our nine billion dollar telescope at the sun or we fry it right so we want to avoid doing that which means we can only point the telescope outwards so we can see mars outwards um so we can see mars and jupiter and saturn and uranus and neptune and all of the cold icy things out there uh like pluto and the other kuiper belt objects i have seen that webb has observed pluto but we don't have the, the data public from that yet. So I'm really excited to see what Webb can teach us about Pluto. And, and I am still uh, firmly on team. Pluto is a planet. Okay. Because that's what I grew okay. up with. So. Uh, right. Jeez, and I'm on team. Pluto is the king of the Kuiper belt myself. <laughs> Pluto, Pluto has friends. Pluto has friends. You know, I grew up with with food not, um, not being not being a planet, so I can't wait. We end on that. So weird, wild times that we live in. All right, Swatha. I think we've probably monopolized enough of this conversation, and I know we have some members who are eager to have their questions answered as well. Yeah, let's go, members. Um, first, we have up uh, Mary Reichert. Hi. My name is Mary Rickert, and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm so excited about this project. I have a couple of questions. And the first one is when we talk about black holes, um, given that there's no light that is emitted from them and they really can't be seen, how will you be able to describe that to blind people. So this is Kelly again. Um, so the question was, if black holes don't emit any light, uh, how can we uh, see them and how can we describe that to blind people? So um, that is correct. One definition of a black hole is something that is so massive that not even light can escape its gravitational pull. Um, black holes are really small, really dense objects. They range in size from something uh, the size of a star to something that is billions of times the mass of our own sun. 
So black holes span lots of different ranges of mass, but they're all very teeny tiny. Uh, one thing that black holes do, however, is they tend to have disks of gas and dust that surround them and swirl around them and fall eventually into the black hole, some of it. And those can get really, really hot, so hot that it starts glowing and they can glow in X-rays, which are, you know, ridiculously energetic short wavelength light. And they can actually glow through all different types of light. So we can see them with X-ray light. We can see them with visible light. We can see them in infrared light. And even they have powerful magnetic fields surrounding them and they have little particles swirling around that. And that can even make radio light. So we can see black holes basically with whatever type of telescope we look at. Um, and so we see them as very bright, but very teeny tiny little sources in the night sky. Thanks, Kelly. Claire or Tim, anything you'd like to add? I'll, I'll throw on there that, that the same way that we have been uh, taking these other Im wonderful images of the universe and sharing them through alt text and other methods uh, for for people to observe um, who might be for people who might be blind or visually impaired. Um, we will be doing the same thing with black holes as we get data on them. And Kelly, I, I just okay. have to ask, could you so the observations that many uh, telescopes that take imagery, you know, is very different from from another specialist telescope or group of telescopes um, known as the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a network of radio telescopes that they basically connect to combine to point at the same objects at once. And recently, the this network pointed at the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so for the first time we got a clearer image, but it took an incredible amount of data. They had to literally fly hard drives around the world because it was faster than sending it across the internet uh, to compile everything in one place to start building these images. Kelly, could you just describe from memory very briefly what the shape of the black hole looks like in that Event Horizon Telescope image? Yeah, so the shape of that image, I think it reminds a lot of people of a donut with a hole in the middle. Um, so there are three big blobs, um, which are that glowing gas, which is surrounding the black hole. And then the center is the event horizon, the point of no return. If you go past that point, light can't get out of your telescope. And so we are actually seeing that shadow from the black hole eating the stuff around it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and awesome. I think, uh, this inspired Krispy Kreme to give away free donuts. Um, <laughs> in case, you know, you're thinking about food and you were hungry. Hey, always food, always sweet. I believe it was Homer Simpson who first came up with the idea of a donut shaped universe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, another, another way that you all have been uh, I guess making these images more accessible, and, and certainly it comes to mind when talking about a, a black hole. Um, you know, as as Mary phrased it in her question, um, you know, describing something that can't be seen. And you certainly shared that there are ways to to see or identify a black hole. Um, but it, I believe some of the work that you're doing is also includes turning these images into. Uh, either audible or musical representations. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about the sonification work that you all are doing? So Claire, you were actually on a project recently to sonify uh, a few of the first images from web. So not a black hole, but uh, we did do some translation, just like we have to translate that infrared information into visible light for people to see that we can translate that information into sound and claire would you like to talk a little bit more about that sure so uh we worked with a team through nasa's universe of learning uh to adapt this the images to sound 
Um, the makeup of the team was uh, three astronomers, um, one of whom is a musician, along with another professionally trained musician and myself, a writer, who happened to be in the room as those images and decisions were made. Um, so for example, they chose to sonify the Southern Ring Nebula. And in the primary image that's released, there are actually two views, one in near infrared light of it and the second in mid infrared. So what the sound does is it scans the image from left to right. So the first image it encounters is that near infrared light image and you hear one boop to see the star, to hear the star that's shown that you know anyone who can see could, could see easily. It's very bright, it's very large. And then as the sound progresses and you get to the middle of the second image in mid infrared light, you hear boop, boop. And so you're hearing that there are in fact two stars at the center, which is why it has a misshapen oval. It's because they're a binary pair that are orbiting one another. And so all the gas that's ejected in the dust by one star is getting offset by the other as it orbits and it's kind of stirring up the dust in that pot. Um, so that really helps bring it to life. But my favorite, which I believe Tim has ready to play, is um, known as a spectrum. So it's a transmission spectrum of an exoplanet known, or basically a planet that's not in our solar system, which is why we have the exo, the extrasolar planet. Um, so it's far flung, not nearby. Um, and astronomers observed it as it was orbiting its planet um, to see when, um, how long that orbit might last. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, so uh, for this planet, we're watching it go in front of its star. And we're also watching the starlight shine through the atmosphere of the planet. And by looking at what type of light that atmosphere is absorbing, we can tell what the atmosphere of a planet a thousand light years away is made out of, which is just completely wild. <laughs> it always, that sort of thing always surprises me that this works, but it does. And there were clear signatures of water in that spectrum. Exactly. So the, uh, the team decided to assign a little water droplet sound each time you encounter the highest peak. So there's three data points that indicate water. And so it's just at the, the middle point where a water droplet was assigned. Um, so if you'd like, we could listen. So Claire, describe it to us again. What were those four water droplet sounds? That's uh, the, so this is a graph, a line graph, X and Y plot. Um, and there are individual data points plotted all across it. I should have brought up the alt text for this one too. Um, and then at various points, uh, water was detected. And so each time you hear the drop, that's where you hear the water that was detected. And Kelly, I don't know yeah. if you want to add to that in terms of how the data were. Assigned. Yeah. So um, basically what we have done is we have taken the light from the star and we've spread it out into its component wavelengths. And we've taken a measurement at lots of different wavelengths. And each one of those measurements is a dot. And the more... Uh, light that the planet's atmosphere has absor absorbed, um, the louder the sound. And when we are detecting at that particular wavelength, the planet is absorbing that light. And that means there's water. You're hearing the little water droplets. I so will highly suggest that folks go to a web telescope, that's web with two Bs, dot org. Uh, and check out the alt text, and in particular, the text description of this. Uh, the writer who did that has a wonderful way with graphs, graphs and uh, actually goes through and describes what each of the different uh, pieces are that are on this graph and really paints a picture with words of what's happening in this sound and lets you experience what's going on. And I'll throw in there that this 
might have been one of my favorite pieces of web's first data so much of what web is going to be sending back actually isn't pictures it's actually spectra uh, it's actually this this light spread out and these graphs of how that light goes up and down. Um, I'm talking with my hands, moving my finger up and down as I'm as I'm saying okay. that. Um, and there's so much information captured in there. We can learn about all sorts of things, like what what planet atmospheres are made of, how fast things are moving, um, the distance that different things may be away from us. Um, and that's that's really kind of like not getting into the details at all. This is where so much of web science is gonna come from, is, is from this. And this is also the data that I think really translates well to sound. Um, much, It's much easier to follow it along in sound than it is trying to listen to the images and we've done some we we like claire was describing we've done some sonifications of those as well but personally i'm hoping we get to do a lot more of those uh, as yes. we go on and i would add listening to the images is more like uh i'm just comparing it to other disciplines um watching or listening to a ballet like the footsteps that you hear in the in the order and the patterns um or abstract art where you can imagine a painter running their hand up and down in kind of crazy motions along the, the frame, the canvas. Um, so it's a lot more, um, there's a lot more opportunity for interpretation, but also plenty of opportunity for awe. They're, they're just beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so also I recommend if you go to the website, there are multiple versions um, of the cosmic cliffs in the Carina Nebula. For example, you can hear just the top, just the bottom, only the stars, so that you can start to hear the different layers in that image. And then you can hear everything all at once. Um, that's the primary video at the top. It's a little overwhelming for me, um, but it is also very gorgeous uh, as, a, as a listening experience. So I highly recommend. But I agree with Tim. I'm very excited about uh, the graphs, <laughs> the spectra, um, and all the interesting data points that we're going to learn about extremely distant objects in the universe that are just not possible in quite the same way with imagery. So can you, so going back to the graph, um, how did it go the process like of, of grabbing the motion for the, of planets or motion or how um how do you how do you come up with that like kind of that tone or that like kind of a scale of what the graph says in sound so i think kelly described this a little bit the um the sounds were applied based on the height of the um line on the graph so higher or lower um the water droplets, of course, were there to indicate, you know, exactly where water was um, found. Um, Kelly, is there anything you want to add about the, you know, how these data points are captured to begin with? Yeah. So you can imagine um, you a planet is moving in front of its star, and we're watching the starlight shine through, and then we're we're taking just very very narrow slices of uh, the light that we're seeing from that planet. And at those very narrow slices of light, some molecules in the planet's atmosphere are blocking some of the light. And so what we're doing is we're saying, at this wavelength, how much of the light is blocked? At this wavelength, how much of the light is blocked? At this wavelength, how much of the light is blocked? And we can compare that to uh, doing an experiment on Earth to see how much water vapor blocks light and compare the two. And that's uh, what we're doing here. If that makes sense. I think you tell like my mind is just really well <laughs> I think it, it, it makes as much sense as it's going to. Exactly. Um. <laughs> Trust it's I think it's you might be struggling with this a little bit, but sighted people struggle with this too. So I wouldn't oh, feel yes. that. Well, and that's <laughs> equity. So that's what we like there to see. We're yeah. glad that we have the <laughs> opportunity to struggle as much as everyone else. Yep. And I might, I might add there's an extensive, I think it's a six article series on webtelescope.org, you know, what is spectroscopy? And it 
literally walks you through every little detail. Um, it's very, very in-depth. So feel free to dive in too. Absolutely. And I know Mary has one more question. Um, and we've got other folks with questions as well. So I'll just uh, move us right along here a little bit. Given all of the elements or objects in deep space, um, when we're talking about those objects, how will you describe their distance from the Earth, um, comparing stars and objects that are closer versus stars and objects that are farther away, especially given that all of the Earth and these elements are all moving themselves? All right, who wants to start with that? So, oh, go ahead. I think that question actually makes us a little bit of uh, the science. How do we know? How on earth do we know this? Um, that to me is information that ends up in the press release and the caption. Um, Tim? Yeah, I, I was, I was kind of going to follow along with the same thing. When you look at an image, you can't tell how far away a star is. You can't tell how far away a galaxy is. Um, it's there there might maybe be some hints in the color but that's that's not something you can trust um so like claire was saying we would put that information in the caption in the article something like that and that sort of information actually that's one of the things we use those spectra for is figuring out how far away each of these different bits are uh yes uh, and so maybe to get into the science just a wee little bit, because I think it's a good question. <laughs> uh, so yes, everything in space is moving. We're moving through space. The Earth is orbiting the sun. The sun is moving through the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is moving within the local group of galaxies. Um, and space itself is expanding. So the space between galaxies is getting bigger. And almost all of those movements, with ex the exception of the Earth moving around the sun, are very small on human time scales. So if you take an astronomical photo now and you take one 20 years from now, most things will look more or less the same. And so we have to have additional techniques to try to figure out the history of the universe and the history of how things have moved within the universe. So Kelly, I think another aspect of this question, and you touched on it a little bit with the Neptune photo with that sneaky little moon, <laughs> uh, but you can have a very bright star that is, it, it, and it could even be a very big star that is very bright, but far, far, far away. That's three fars. Uh, but you could have a, a medium sized star that's only far away but visually they may look the same. You know, the, the one that's three fars away might still look brighter or look bigger. So how, how do you all convey that in the, in the alt text or the captions for these images? Yeah, so that's really a big problem in astronomy is how far away are things? Because really we see the entire three-dimensional universe compressed into a 2D photo. And so generally that's not going to be something that shows up in the alt text because as we were saying, you know, uh, we're not trying to explain any of the science. We're just trying to describe what's there. And you really can't tell how far away something is from the alt text. Um, except maybe you could have a, there's, there's a couple of nearby stars which move um, if you take pictures 20 years apart, maybe they're moving and maybe that's the science story that you're trying to tell and that would be in the alt text of the image. But for most of that, that's something that would go in a caption or an article to explain the process of determining the distance to a star or a galaxy or a planet around another star. Thank you. All right, Swatha, who's next? Next we have Nikki Colby. Hi, this is Nikki Kobe from Minnesota. I'm a huge space fan, so this is really awesome and exciting. And my question for you is, how do you plan to make future information easier to understand 
for those of us who can't see the pictures. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic question. I'm, I'm very excited to be able to talk to all of you as well. And we're going to keep doing work like this with the alt text, of course. Um, but we really are exploring other things as well. We talked a little bit about sonifications, um, and there are other things that we're really trying to explore as well. We've actually been looking a little bit into some tactile images recently as well. Um, I've been working with Kelly and uh, with, with another writer here, Anne, um, to create uh, both some larger exhibits that have audio embedded in them with, with different sensors. So as you, as you move your hands over the image, first you get these raised uh, crests and peaks and valleys and texture, and you can feel uh, what is going on in the image. And we, in there, there are some little electronic sensors with so that when you touch a particular one, there's some audio that will play and it'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in that particular spot. And you move your hand somewhere else, you can find another one and figure out what's going on in that particular spot. And it's a chance to explore the whole image. Um, we're, we, we're both doing that. We've got some, some bigger ones and we also are creating some smaller panels that are about one foot by one foot. And we've got a, uh, about 200 of those that are gonna be going around to different libraries and museums around the country. Um, hopefully they'll be reaching out to folks in their own local community to let them know that they're there. Um, and these again will be a chance for people to explore. Those ones don't have the audio embedded, but we are sending some information to teach uh, the people who are receiving these both about the science so that they can explain it uh, and about how to use these with uh, all sorts of different folks. And we've had we've had some some great feedback uh, from from people who tried using these before, both uh, sighted folks and for uh, blind and visually impaired folks who've given some feedback and helped with those guides. So those are some of the things that we're trying to explore. And we're looking for more as well. So if you've got some ideas, if there's some way that you think would be really good for you, I mean, you can always go to our website and there is a contact us form. Uh, drop us a line. Because I'm interested in these, um, how are you going to learn it? How, how, how do you plan to, plan to look for um, those with students who have the site? Or do you plan to like have them, um, have the images be like, just the way they are now? Like how do you plan to use them or to like, lay them out essentially? How do, how do we plan to, to lay out the, the tactile images? Yeah. like That's really going to depend on the local institution. Um, Every museum, every library is different. Uh, we're very much encouraging folks to use these with facilitated programs because it's if 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 we stick a picture of if we stick one of these pictures uh, that we've been talking about on the wall, um, if you're not an astronomer, if you're not in that community, if you're not a space nerd, you you, you probably think, oh, that's a wonderful, a gorgeous picture, but I don't really know what's going on in there. Uh, the same thing is true with the tactile images. If we if we stick them in if we stick them on a table, people can explore them and, and learn all about them. But well, there's there's <laughs> what what's going on? I have no clue. Um, so we're really encouraging folks to do some facilitated uh, experiences where people can can talk to folks and learn a little bit about what's going on in, in them. So again, to rephrase the question, um, mm -hmm. like, how are you just themselves gonna gonna be like gonna look? Are you going to you plan to like you plan to have them like have a tactile elements on the, uh, on the images that you that you already sent on the website or? Mm. These these images that we are sending out are are separate from the from they're they're, they're entities in and of themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got about we've got about two hundred of them, and they have they're, they're both tactile, and they've got the image the full color image printed on them, which is going to help folks with um, various all along uh, the spectrum of sightedness, as as Clark was describing earlier. Um, but then we have the the standard images, which are which are available digitally as well for folks. Um, anybody else have anything to add to that? No. 
Okay. And and Tim, just one one more question on that topic. Yeah. Will the the alt text I imagine will be as relevant for the physical hands on tactile image as it would be for the digital images on the website as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll make sure that the sites have those as well. Great. All right. I think our next member question is from Kathy. I'm Kathy Nimmer from West Lafayette, Indiana. And I am the 2015 Indiana Teacher of the Year and finalist for National Teacher of the Year. At two recent public speaking events, one of which was a benefit concert where I was MC, I read portions of your alternative text to the enthralled audience. Did you have any idea how impactful that alternative text would be and how much it would inspire both blind and sighted people alike? That's, that's just fantastic to hear. Um, the response has been overwhelming. Um, the response that we've got uh, in places like this that we've seen online um, from people talk to, talking to us uh, wherever we go about this, the interest across NASA in, in what we've done, it's, it's been fantastic. And I, I don't think we could have expected quite the amount of feedback that we have gotten. And this is Claire, I'll add to this because I was one of the writers and am going to continue to write this alt text. Um, I had I had no idea how, how profound the impact would be. And I am so delighted uh, that we've been so successful because sometimes looking at these images, it's just a little bit overwhelming. Where do I start? Uh, what's the focal point? How do I describe all these layers of overlapping gas and dust in a way that's meaningful? Um, but also, I hope creates this this beautiful image. Um, and I will share, I do have a minor in poetry and I do think that played a role. Uh, that really taught me to pack as much information as possible into a short, uh, concise, easy to listen to uh, sentence or phrase. Um, and I know that the other writers who contributed to this project have, have similar backgrounds, although one uh, is one of our designers. Um, so it's really picking apart the composition of the image and literally describing what you see, not what you know. Uh, so separating your, your brain from what you're literally seeing with your eyes um, and staying true to that. But I have just been so profoundly happy to to read all of these comments and to hear how important and experiential uh, it is that is the best i could have ever imagined um, so this is just the best feedback to see and to hear yeah absolutely so this is kelly and i'll uh, echo both what tim and claire have said uh, when we were doing this alt text initially i wanted to do it right i wanted to it to be both beautiful and scientifically accurate. And I thought it would be read by a handful of people, um, you know, blind space nerds. Uh, but to see this uh, on social media blow up and all of these people express such gratitude for this and it was completely overwhelming and magical. And it really cemented my um, desire to keep doing this work going forward. That's great. And I believe we have a, a second question from Kathy as well. As a career English teacher, I was entranced by your specific and powerful word choice. I'm wondering what your writing process was like and whether you intended the alternative text to be as poetic as it turned out to be. I think the quality of the alt text really is um, owed to the the experience and the talent of all the writers and then the contributors to so the scientists and educators um, who are reviewing it. Um, there's 
there's one writer who's been, you know, working on this material for decades. Uh, there's other of us, others of us, it's only been five years or many fewer in some cases. Um, but just bringing all of our creativity uh, to bear is just so important for me. I want to communicate as clearly as possible um, absolutely everything that I can do to mirror a visual experience and an audio experience. They are never going to be one-to-one. -one. There will always be room to do better. Um, but in the way that we try to take you on a journey when we release press releases, I, I really want the alt text to be the same. Um, so I try to go into this flow state um, where I'm really experiencing and, and letting the writing kind of deliver itself as a, after I've learned about the image. So I'm very, very happy to hear that that, that has worked. All right, so Kelly, is it, uh, is it just astronomy speak or are words like blobby and others meant mm -hmm. to be uh, poetic or artistic for the sake of alt text? Mm -hmm. I mean, both probably. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, so, you know, astronomers will, if you show up to an astronomy talk given by astronomers for astronomers, and we're talking about a nebula, we will describe something as blobby or look at that blob over there. Um, there are other words that um, we use in everyday speech and we have to be a little careful with if we're talking about something scientific. Uh, so something that I've run into a lot is uh, describing something as a spiral versus judge, um, describing something as an arc. So different physics tends to produce arcs versus spirals in space. And so we have to be very specific about which one we're talking about. Um, so yeah, there are lots of everyday words that astronomers, for lack of a better word to describe what they're looking at, have sort of appropriated into scientific jargon. I like it. All right, Swatha, who's next? Next we have Timothy Wynn. My name is Timothy Wynn and I'm from Miami, Florida. And my question is in regards to how the image descriptions are written. What aspects are considered when writing the image descriptions? Does it start with the scientifically significant features or the eye-catching areas or colors that a viewer might focus in on? And Claire, would you like to start here? Because I think you already touched on this a little bit. Sure. So I start very generally. I sketch a scene, right? It's, you know, imagine holding just a simple pen or a very thin paintbrush in your hand and just kind of barely putting some some color or texture on the page. Um, so I start start broadly, broad strokes, and then um, just like in drawing class, okay, you, you start with that overall sketch, but so you don't begin with the the finer, you know, tones, colors, shapes in an image. Um, start very broad, and then you go very narrow. Um, so I'm actually incidentally a backcountry hiker, um, and I know that there are tactile maps as well, so you might be able to relate to this. Um, but whenever I look at a map, I'm looking at the biggest features. Where are the mountain ranges? Where are the waterfalls? Um, and then I zone in and I kind of, I start to look for more detail. Okay, well, where are the hiking paths? And then how long are they? And I measure that out because there are those really tiny, teeny tiny measurements um, that you can then map out your route. So it's the same way. So I might, I'll start very broadly. And then, as I said earlier, um, whatever the area of focus is. So we were um, listening to the alt text for the planetary nebula earlier. So I will very likely, because it's scientifically uh, most relevant, describe the stars at the center um, and then begin describing the layers of gas and dust that are overflowing in some sense, kind of looking like they're filling up the screen um, and running into each other. And sometimes there are really bright spikes from the stars that are finding their ways through these little holes in the dust. So just as the way I've described this scene, I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper into those details. So I start very broad and then I get very specific. 
and I make sure to mention all the relevant details that will be covered in the press release or the caption itself so that there's that complementary factor between the alt text and the caption text. So the caption's teaching you why we're seeing that, the physics of it, how that came to be, and the alt text is very literally describing the scene. Uh, thanks for that, Claire. And uh, one more question. I realize we, uh, <laughs> we we were monopolizing monopolizing a lot of your time, and I, we're so thankful that you all have been able to, to stay with us. I hope, uh, I know some of you may have some conflicts, but I, I hope we can continue the conversation. Um, so Claire, if you have to leave soon, we totally understand that. But one question before you go. Uh, Many folks have noticed on in the alt text uh, the references to a clock face. Um, where what was the inspiration for using that as a, a frame of reference for the alt text? So I will admit um, I am constantly when I'm looking for directions, I'm constantly mixing up east and west, and then combine that. Uh, with how we put compasses on astronomical images that could be reversed. So I don't want to confuse people um, by citing it one way based on how we say it when we look at a map of the Earth and say you're navigating a national park, um, and another when you're navigating uh, the, the cosmos. Um, so a clock seemed much more approachable to me, much more uh, known, though I realize it is uh, not the latest digital advance. Even you, know, the fancy digital, beautiful watches uh, have those old school clock face opportunities um, for you to select. So I just find it is more a, a commonly known, commonly recognized feature. I'm trying to make it something that's quite intuitive, um, but I'm very interested if it's not. So if you have any recommendations for different um, ways of pointing out the, the areas in the image, happy to hear them. Sometimes we go with right and left and top and bottom, bottom left, top left, that kind of thing. Um, it's just another way to vary it, especially in a very, very complicated image like a deep field, which is just filled with galaxies of all shapes and sizes mixed with stars. And then you complicate that with gravitational lensing that has these crazy arcs that show up and are repeated in mirror images, but in different shapes. It's So there's a lot. It's It's just a way to orient for me. Very interesting, thank you. All right, Swatha, what, who's next? We have Denison Asuncion, co-founder of Global Security Awareness Day, or GAT. Hey there, this is Jenison Asuncion in San Jose, California. I am co-founder of Global Accessibility Awareness Day and the GAD Foundation. My question is, was your hope in creating these alternative text descriptions that people with disabilities would become more engaged in STEM? Hi, Jenison. Um, this is Tim. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think uh, the basis of everything that I do here at Space Telescope, and I know that's true for many of us here, is that people will become more engaged with science, technology, engineering, math. Um, and for the the alt text, yeah, I, I think I mentioned a little bit at the beginning how so much of what there is in astronomy is, is, is visually based right now. And by creating alt text, we're creating a, a window into the universe for people who have not been able to peer through that before. If they're able to hear uh, what's going on or read it or, or access that, that amazing stuff in a different way. And yeah, this is, this is Kelly. Um, my whole career has been spent trying to bring all of this cool astronomy knowledge out of uh, the astronomy department, the ivory tower, to people and meeting them where they are. Um, you know, I ran events at bars where we talk about space over beer um, and just try to catch people who were just happened to be there, right? Um, but also, it seems to me that right now, there is a lot of interest in space from the visually impaired community that hasn't been met. And that's really why there's all of this excitement around alt text. And I'm 
really glad to be uh, reaching this new audience right where they are with and through means that are accessible to them. And Jenison mentioned STEM, uh, and just to clarify, so that's a science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and sorry to jump in front of you there, Swatha, go ahead. No problem, Clark. Um, so to kind of follow up on that, how, are, how do you think we can encourage more folks with disabilities or a more blind and low vision um, students to consider STEM or science, technology, engineering, and math as a viable career field or as a viable field of study? Because, I mean, Clark mentioned earlier in the, in the video that he, he realized that it was not going to be a sitting university with this low vision, so, or just losing the vision, so. Yeah. I, I, there, there are definitely a few things. Um, one is making sure that the data is more accessible. Um, so we've got things like alt text, we've got things like sonifications, which can help bring bring some of this data in 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 ways that folks can perceive. Um, an, another another big thing is kind of opening opening up people's minds to the idea that astronomy is not just all of these pretty pictures. There's a lot of data involved. There's, there's, in fact, some types of data which the ears are a whole lot more effective at uh, being able to uh, process. Uh, there's one astronomer, uh, Gary Foran from Swinburne University down in Australia, um, who all of his work is focused on listening to to things like these spectra and and figuring out what classifying what's going on with them. He is blind. Um, there are uh, a few blind astronomers out there, and and that's actually really kind of a, a third way is showing role models. Uh, this is work that people are doing already. Uh, it's it's not beyond anyone's ability. It's there. There are things where folks have strengths, and we need to find ways to help them meet their strengths and and help out this field because we we are often limited by always always approaching things in the same way. So if there are more folks out there who want to come in and 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 get involved with this and try to approach it in and with a different perspective on things, I think that'd be really good for both those people and for the field as a whole. Yes, absolutely, Tim. Um, so this is Kelly again. Um, there are lots of aspects of astronomy. We think of it as a visual field, but there's lots of creating models of things that we cannot see and matching that to data. Um, and I think that's a particular talent of uh, blind and visually impaired people. I've read somewhere that uh, Blind people tend to be better at organic chemistry because they can visualize molecules in a he their head the way that sighted people can't. And so I think there's a real opportunity out there and we just need to build the, the STEM identity, the ability to think, yes, I could be a scientist. This is for me. This is really cool and I want to learn more about it. What steps can ACB take in this, in this end, do you think? Or what can we do with this? Yeah. To promote, to promote the accessibility of astronomy or of um, STEM in general. I think uh, things like this conversation are a big part of it. Um, letting people know that, that those opportunities are out there um, and letting people know what sorts of resources there are to get into different activities that that they might not otherwise consider um i think yeah there's 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 so much that exists and i'll say we are not the experts on how to reach out to folks who might use these resources um, we need we need help from folks like like ACB on on how do we get the work that we're that we're trying to do out to folks and how can we get them involved? How do we share the opportunities that that, that exist? So that's that's one big piece of it. And that is a that is a role that we are more than happy to fill. Uh, so Tim. Claire and Kelly, thank you so much for your time here today and for joining us to 
talk about these images from the James Webb Space Telescope and the, the geez, innovative, uh, creative, awe-inspiring alt text uh, that has fascinated so many of our members and the broader community. But also, thank you for sharing the work of the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, I know we have a, a few more questions that we did not get to. So if it's all right, we'd love to be able to follow up with you all in, in writing about those questions and share those as well. You know, this, uh, this event's been a few, a few months in the making here as our, our Twitter feed and social media and news feeds and every, everything was just so focused on the work that you all and your team are doing and the way it's being shared. Uh, with everyone around the world. And I have to think back to one of our first conversations where one of your colleagues said that they got involved in space science, um, not because they, they liked astronomy, physics, chemistry, math, and all that, but because space was beautiful. And for all of ACB, all of the members of the American Council of the Blind, I'd just like to say thank you for sharing your work and sharing the beauty with all of us. It has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I, I really do hope that more people are getting involved in, in science, technology, engineering, math. You're thinking about these things in new ways that, that, that you just, everybody, no matter who you are, um, take advantage of the, of the abilities you have and the, the strengths that you bring to the table. Explore this world and figure out how can I make a difference and how can I look at this wonderful, amazing place that we all live in and uh, appreciate it for, for, for what it is. Yeah, and uh, yes, I was, I'm was. i so glad to have been able to have this conversation with you and talk about the work that we've done and uh the sky is for everyone and by everyone i mean everyone and so i'm really glad that we have found ways to connect with people and that you all have appreciated all the hard work we've done well we always close our podcasts by uh by saying a, a quick little phrase in this case i'm going to say keep alt texting uh, but swatha you want to close us with what we always say keep advocating